are so proud of me. I'm Tommy Salmons. This is Year Zero. Today, I have the great honor of chatting with Jake. Jake is a former Marine. He suffered from PTSD for years, and he began microdosing. He's a big proponent of the use of psilocybin for mental disorders and um, PTSD in particular. And I wanted to have him on and kind of discuss his experiences, what he found, and uh, how it changed his life. So I hope you all enjoy this episode. RyanBunting.com for all of your graphic design needs. Go to RyanBunting.com. Ryan Bunting is a great libertarian and a great anarcho-capitalist. He's also a great graphic designer. He designed my podcast logo and Pete Quinone's podcast logo for Free Man Beyond the Wall. So go to RyanBunting.com for all of your graphic design needs and check out his book, Project Manicore. You can get it there at RyanBunting.com. Thank you, Tom Burton, for the music. And don't forget, it's the Libertarian Institute Fall Fund Drive. So help support all your favorite podcasts and writers at the Libertarian Institute by donating uh, what you can afford to give up, whether it's $2, $5, or $25,000. We'll take it because we got to keep our lights on and keep the bills paid. So... Go to the libertarianinstitute.org forward slash donate and send us some money. All right. Enjoy the show. All right. I'm here with Jake. What's going on, dude? Oh, same old same, man. Just uh, taking it easy on a Sunday. Shit. Yeah, I've been drinking beer all day, so you got to forgive me, man. My wife just got back in town, so it was, it was a beer drinking holiday today. Oh, yeah. So, but you, uh, I, I, I was introduced to you by a friend of ours who's been on my show, Brian. And, uh, he, he told me that, like, you're really informed on the, the entire psilocybin movement. And what psilocybin will do for people with mental illness and PTSD. I happen to know Michael Heiss. I don't know if you know the name, but he's the guy who got psilocybin legalized in Denver. So, no, oh, nice. Yeah. So I happen to know him. And uh, so this was, I thought this was a really cool conversation to have and get involved in. So I want to kind of let you take it. And, and I'll ask questions as I uh, as they come to mind, but I, I kind of want want to let you kind of lead us into what led to people looking at psilocybin as a treatment for PTSD and mental illness and these types of things. What where did that come from? Well, in uh, in the past, it was it was illegal to study those substances and. Uh, Recently, I don't have the stats on it, but uh, at least 2017 or so, uh, I was seeing a psychiatrist at the time for uh, for grief. My, my dad had passed away. He recommended that uh, I go see about a medical clinical trial because they're dosing people with microdoses of LSD and with psilocybin. Uh, that was due in part to the grief couple with PTSD from my time in the Marine Corps. And uh, at the time, you know, I drove around all day for a living as a, a pest control guy. And I'd had LSD before and driving around on, on that shit at work and stuff didn't seem like the most productive way to go about it. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't understand the concept of microdosing and things like that. Um, so I started to look into it and uh, I actually wound up kind of grabbing some some of the psilocybin mushrooms on the side, somebody gifted them to me. And uh, I didn't know much about microdosing and whatnot, but uh, I just took a little bit every day for a little while. And uh, man, it, it was life changing from 
the first day and without tripping or anything, you know, not, not doing it as a party drug or anything like that. Right. It just, uh, <laughs> changed my life. I, I was able to face the grief and face my own problems and, uh, just a really cathartic thing. And it turns out now that, uh, like Yale and Johns Hopkins and, and all these <clears throat> reputable Ivy league places and, uh, hospitals and, and whatnot really smart neuroscience people uh, there's even a journal of uh, psychotherapy pharmacology uh they're all doing studies on this stuff now and uh they're coming up with with really great stuff like uh, <clears throat> for instance the uh, like death anxiety that cancer patients face uh ptsd there it's working wonders for that uh, as little as one dose can give lasting results for for over a year for for patients with with PTSD and uh, they're they're talking about microdoses less than a gram. In my personal experience, it that's been the case. Um, anecdotally, you know, through through friends and stuff that have tried microdosing little capsules and stuff like that, they've uh, they've described it as. The difference being just night and day within the same day I've taken the first capsule. So and, uh, let me, I, I want to interrupt here because you've, you've been through this and I don't think people understand what it means to go through these types of things. I've had Matthew Ho on and we've talked about PTSD and the situations that he's been through and how having like dogs has helped him and things of that nature. But can you give us a little um, glimpse as to what you were dealing with and what happened when you began microdosing? Um, sure. Basically, with within about a nine month period, I'd, I'd lost my entire family. Uh, my, my mom, my my wife and kids, that was a divorce, but my mom passed away through cancer. I'd been dealing with PTSD for years uh, due to Marine Corps. So um, the way that it affected my life was basically shut the entire entire thing down. Sometimes a good day for me was getting up, putting my clothes on. And I used to consider going to the store or going to a restaurant or something to be like a, a major victory. Uh, I was pretty devastated with, you know, the depression, the post-stress, nightmares, the, the whole works. I couldn't really function as a human being. So I was strung out on all kinds of drugs and just trying to deal with it in all the wrong ways, I guess. Uh, well, I know all the wrong ways. Well, they were – so the military itself had put you on these drugs? Uh, some of them, yeah. They, they treat with, you know, cocktails of uh, shit like Valium and, and stuff like that. Right. Uh, Xanax and that uh, that psychiatrist that I mentioned, I went to him with private insurance. And he flat out told me after 30 years of drug research and stuff, said, man, look, I can prescribe you pills until the day you die and treat your symptoms. But if you want to be cured, you need to go and get on one of these microdosing trials. And uh, the guy was right. And they're uh they're saying that, that it's literally like a, a cure, but. And, and what, what did you experience? Like when you, um, started microdosing? Cause you um, would, I, and the reason I ask is cause I, we, you and I have been talking in the background beyond this podcast. And a lot of people aren't familiar with that conversation, but I know that there's, there's some some part of you like you're you're trusting in what you're experiencing so i think it's it's worthy for people to understand like why somebody would like turn to the microdosing regime as opposed to the pharmaceutical regime well uh, this is the way that i generally put it the, the feeling that i got when i started doing that was uh it was exactly like having uh, yourself reset to a time before you were hurt. Like whatever damage was done to you through, uh, you know, trauma and emotions, uh, emotional distress and stuff like that. It, 
it just resets that to a time before that happened. I mean, it still happened. You don't forget or anything, but it gives you the mental and emotional capacity to, to deal with it, to face it and just, just move on. And, uh, almost like a, a not childlike wonder, but it <clears throat> returned me to a, a sense of well being that, that I hadn't had since I was 20. And it had been a, a damn long time since I felt good about myself. Now I'm happy every day. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's one of the things I have, I have a hard time with having conversations with, with veterans. And it's not because I, I don't feel, feel for the veterans. It's because I think I feel too much for the veterans. I, I think there's, you know, I, 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 I have Matthew Ho on, I've had typo on, I've had quite a few guys on and we've talked about military service. We've talked about how, how it affected us. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't go see action in a foreign country, but I know what they do to a person just throughout the training and so whenever you actually do go see action that's that's a completely different thing that they've completely changed your personality have you been able to rediscover that that innocence that that ability that creativity that ability to explore that was there prior to going to um, going overseas. I, I don't even know where you served at. Sorry. You know, I, I'm glad you asked it in that way because uh, it, it certainly has. Um, like a person could go through boot camp and never see any action at all, but you'll be programmed to have a positive response to things like. Uh, what makes the grass grow kill 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 or i mean the answer yes is usually replaced with the word kill and it that changes you and they it, there's a whole process i'm sure that everybody knows you basically come out brainwashed and uh you're a different person the marines tagline when i joined was actually the change is forever and <laughs> it I used to, I used to agree. Uh, and you're like, no, damn it. <laughs> I'm going to <laughs> fucking fix this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, y'all it, fucked it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the change was forever. It, it felt like it, it, it was a fucking bad change though. They didn't tell you what the change was. And, right. uh, since, since experimenting with the, uh, the psilocybin and stuff, I have, I mean, I've, I've gone back to basically like my high school days, pre pre boot camp. Like I haven't forgotten my training or any of that stuff, but, uh, like, I, I don't care about any of that stuff anymore. <laughs> I used to be a gunsmith, and um, I could give a shit less about guns and, and stuff now. Like, I still have a passive professional interest in them, but I don't spend all night wondering if I'm going to have to use one. I don't carry one. Uh, I just don't, I don't worry about any of those things. I, I try to stay smart about stuff. I carry a stick for beating snakes away from my dog with, but it... Uh, it's definitely, it's definitely put me back to, uh, to a time before I thought that the right answer to stuff was fucking kill it. And my, uh, my squad leader used to have a uh, sign on his door. It said, in absence of orders, find something and kill it. And that was a quote from Erwin Rommel, but this was in the United States Marine Corps. The, the parallels between the, the two groups are alarming at times, but, uh, yeah, yeah I think that, this substance has definitely done a good job of washing the taste of that shit out of my mouth. Yeah. And I'm glad to have it too. Why, what do you think, what do you think it is that you've, you've discovered that it's kind of like, I, I hate the word revert, but it's kind of put you back in outside of that, that, mindscape that they try to force you into you've you've obviously discovered something so what do you think it is that psilocybin is has brought to your attention that that you've you've been able to grab onto 
Um, well, physically, what it does is, is it helps to regrow your uh, your dopamine receptors, which, of course, I burned mine out with uh, self treatment and government treatment and whatnot. But um, emotionally, I was able just to kind of reconnect to uh, a past before all of the uh, all of the bad stuff. Um, I kind of. I don't even, I don't believe in like the concept of a bad trip. Now they call them challenging trips and I've never had one. It's always been a good experience for me. Um, so I, I kind of just latch on to, uh, I don't know, I guess like, um, I remember friends and and family and things like that. It's weird. It sort of, I used to experiment a little in high school and stuff with LSD and, if I take a mushroom trip at times, it'll kind of reconnect me to uh, like almost through space and time or whatnot to, to those times and kind of let you get in your mind and walk around and uh, tour your life, you know, and you can go see the the good shit that you enjoyed instead of worrying about the bad things that are like hanging over you all the time and, and whatnot. Yeah. And you were, where were you deployed at? Um, when you were, when you were in the Marines, I'm sorry. Uh, combat wise in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, so before you, that, you were in both. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. before that Japan and stuff like that, uh, I was an infantryman, obviously. Um, so all I did day in and day out was fire guns. At- 11, 11 Bravo is what, what I was whenever I was in. So. Yeah, yeah, that was that was three eleven. So it's it's the same basic rifleman, I guess. And uh, yeah. <clears throat> so, when did you start noticing that you were having these negative uh, effects on your personality? You know, it, that really took a long time uh, because I so firmly believed in everything that we were doing. Um, you know, like during the violence, you're, you're just trying to protect the guys around you. You're not really trying to, to harm people and shit, but that's, that's how you protect the guys around you. Right. It was actually probably five years after, um, maybe four that it really started to kind of just creep up and, um, nightmares and shit started and started getting depression and, uh, and things like that. I noticed that I was becoming a harder person earlier than that because I, I, I lost people. I lost a lot of friends, uh, even from back home, uh, people that I would call my brother and men still do. I became um, really angry at everything. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, uh, you described it as a harder person, but I think I became much more bitter towards humanity. Oh, yeah, like, man. I, 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 was I, I, I was I was unwilling to tolerate even the slightest like you know I, I just I, I just realized within myself like being able to look back at it I was it was one of those things where I the, just it was the it would be like the slightest little thing would shoot me off the handle it took me oh, yeah, a, yeah. It took me about ten years to get to where I wasn't in that position mentally. I mean it, it was that, it was that really seemed difficult. to be about the going rate. Yeah. It was really difficult. And I never saw combat. You know, if I would have seen combat, who knows how difficult it would have been for me to readjust to society. It it's it's trying at best. Uh, I think I managed to kind of do it now. I don't have the same challenges that I used to when I deal with, with people. Um, yeah, you, I still used to have, to. you still have a hard time talking about it. Though. I can tell. Yeah. It, some of it's not worth mentioning, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not picking on you. I've just, no, no, I mean, I've talked to a, I've talked to a lot of veterans and I can, I can tell by the way you're approaching the subject that there are things that were really, really difficult for you to even still to this day address. 
Yeah. Well, that's uh, that's also because of new ways that I've learned to approach it. Um, a while back, I guess 2015 or so, I uh, I tried a thing online. They they were offering Amazon gift cards, like a five dollar gift card, to do a little survey for this shit called uh, Vets Prevail. And so I did a little survey, and they sent me five bucks, and it they had uh, the cognitive behavior therapy like on time. I wasn't ready for that, but I tried it and, and I, I quit. And then like a year later, I, I tried it again and I'd forgotten that I'd ever tried it before. And so I went through that for a long time. I finally became like a peer counselor at it. And uh, I got some experience with helping other people deal with it. And that really helped me to do. But more than that, though, uh, I guess I don't try to avoid the questions or the memories so much anymore, but I've learned through uh, meditation and, and the psilocybin and stuff, uh, like a combination of wellness things to just make a little space in my life for, for that shit. Cause it, it doesn't go away, but you can, you can make a little room for it and kind of carry it around with you and not let it weigh you down. You uh, certainly don't want it to run your life. Right. And, and there is uh, it's important for, for me to, to mention too, that for any vets or, or people just suffering from anything, they there is a way out of that shit and uh, like nothing can make it all go away, but you can learn to, to carry it around with you and, and forget about it. Uh, so I, I don't think about most of the negative stuff, but it's not like an avoidance thing. It, like I said, just making space. You uh, you learn how to pack that shit up and mm-hmm. carry it with you like you do anything else. You, you forget you're carrying your wallet till you need it. And uh, it's kind of like that. I'm going to, I want to I want to ask a question that I've never asked anybody before, so I, I feel kind of hesitant asking it. So bear with me just a minute, because I want to make sure I ask it in, in a way that's appropriate, and and I'm not saying anything that's over the top. Um, Jordan Peterson had um, he had he had made a comment because he's a psychiatrist, and he had made a comment that. The majority of people that he's ever treated with PTSD, it was, it was a result of what they had done, not what they had seen. It was, it was the, the coming to fruition with your own ability for evil and, and really recognizing your own ability for evil and, and coming to face that part of yourself how much of that do you think is reality uh i think i think the guy's spot on with that because when i first had to to really take a look in the mirror at myself and think about some of the things i've done that's the moment that my life started to crumble it started kind of slowly with other things but once you really take a look at who you've become versus who you were, yeah, it, it all goes away pretty quick. And it, it's a very, very steep drop off. So do you think uh, in my own, so you think he's pretty, he's right on when he says it's, it's not so much what you've seen, but what you've done that, that matters in these circumstances and, and the way you've reacted well, to the situations than, around you. I, I'm just asking. I, I, I honestly I have no idea. I think I think it certainly can be dead on in, in some cases, but you know, not everybody that suffers from PTSD has gone through combat or done something horrible. Uh, right. Some people, you know, take a straight gunshot, walk into their their job or something. Some of them. Um, was, some people were and, just on a movie set with Alec Baldwin. Yeah, yeah, man. That's I mean, that's that's like, a joke that my listeners will get that maybe you miss. But Alec Baldwin <laughs> had a prop gun like kill a woman the other day. So Yeah. Mr. I mean, I mean, gun I've control kind of himself. So. Yeah. Fucking ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, that's that it, so that was the joke. <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean, that that to me like the it's a foreign concept. I would have lost my shit over that it just somebody handed me a loaded gun <laughs> would have fucking pissed me off 
What, but, what it was a, it was a prop to be to be fair. They were filming a movie. It was a prop, and it was kind of like remember when Brandon Lee got shot during the making of The Crow. Yeah, uh, a fragment flew out of the gun unexpectedly. That's what happened. So, to be fair, yeah. that's what happened. We're just making fun of Elvis right. Baldwin. I mean point. that that's still an avoidable circumstance for the most part. I mean, we trained extensively with blank rounds in the core, and uh, you know, the first thing you want to do is make sure you stay the fuck out of the way of the muzzle. And right. uh, the second thing is don't point the muzzle at somebody's face or whatever, because the little pieces of brass from the cramped ends of those guns can fly off. Right. Nobody cleans those guns. They don't think about them as real guns. So that just that causes all kind of problems. Mm-hmm. But. Well, let me let me let me let's get back into like the uh, kind of seriousness of the of the situation because this is kind of a serious podcast, and I, I'm not cracking as many jokes as I do normally during a podcast because I do want to get into the meat of this subject. How, how long was it after you realized that there was a problem? that you began um, your microdosing and in taking psilocybin? Uh, it, it was years because I didn't, I didn't have the information available to me to know that that would be a good course. So I went the route that a lot of vets and, and a lot of people in general take self-medicate in all the wrong ways. And uh, so lots of alcohol, I, I assume. Yeah. Yeah. Things things of that nature and, uh, you know, just self-destructive behaviors in general. Um, did a lot of dangerous shit, riding motorcycles too fast and hitting the white line doing 90 miles an hour. And I have, uh, <laughs> I still have moments. It's not, it's not that I'm hateful or angry, but there are moments where I can't, experience enough adrenaline it's yeah. like the more the better and i was like that for like you, you couldn't you couldn't dose me with enough adrenaline to get me to slow down yeah yeah and, I've done other- yeah <laughs> and i don't know i don't know if that is a certain mindset i don't know if that's a certain personality or if that is something that was done to me, you know what I'm saying? I, I think I've, I've never true. figured that out. I, that I've never, I've never come to the conclusion whether, because I don't remember being like that prior to the military. I mean, I was, I was wild. Like, don't get me wrong. I joined the military when I was 21. So I'd already had some like wild times behind me, but I don't remember ever being having this unquenchable nature to me to where I could do anything and it was just it wasn't enough there was always a limit I had to keep pushing and pushing and pushing I don't ever remember being like that before the military yeah I I may have been a little I I was a lot more cautious but uh, in high school I rode bulls like a dumbass, and so I got a taste yeah, of the adrenaline. cautious, quote unquote. Yeah, riding yeah. bulls. <laughs> That's cautious yeah. as fuck. Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, yep. As cautious as it gets. <laughs> I guess if you're from Texas, that's cautious. I rode bulls. Yeah, I mean, whatever. I waited until really high school to before I rode them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, I don't know, that was my first little taste of adrenaline stuff, I guess. Um, and I liked it. And I liked being a tough guy and having some swagger and stuff like that. I had the scores to, to go to the Navy as an E4 if I would sit on a submarine and do uh, fucking sonar tech or something. <clears throat> and uh, they, wanted me to, they wanted me to be a nuke tech on a sub. And I was like, oh. Man, I think they try to sell everybody there. <laughs> no. <laughs> this my guy calls to blow forever. <laughs> no, just give me a gun and a parachute. I want to jump out of planes and shoot at people. Like, that's all I want. I told these guys, man. And like, what are you into? I was like, well, you know, like hunting, fishing, uh, hiking, shooting, 
shooting some more and uh, being outdoors and shit. And they're like, well, the sub will break the surface about once every six months. And I was like, fuck this. <laughs> <laughs> one thing, the boat goes on top of the water. <laughs> the other, I'm not sure it six months, but it's fucking... <laughs> anyway, like, you want me to ride around in a fucking metal can underwater? What could go wrong with that? I don't have that much desire to uh, feel adrenaline and shit. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, I was My just dad. I was just curious. Did you notice an increase in your um, in your your need for adrenaline though, or or was it pretty much the same? No, I mean it, it definitely increased, um, but it it morphed a little like riding bulls and stuff like that wasn't enough anymore. I, I wanted to fight and I wanted to I wanted to fight harder and harder. Like our live fire stuff that, that really got me going. Like, there's nothing like having a bunch of damn live ammunition flying around you. Right. I got a case for that yeah. even without combat. And, and I loved it. Just, uh, I don't know. We, we were doing some training one day out in the desert in 29 bombs, California. And, Fucking so um, sit down and we're we're having chow and I'm looking at my gear and stuff. I've got a hole through uh through through the ass pack, you know, the, the little bag on the back of your your belt mm-hmm. from the machine gunner shooting grazing fire too low over over the top of us. And I was like, fuck yeah! I mean, I almost got hit by a seven six two by fifty one, but yeah, and my balls good. my balls were almost gone, you know, like <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> shit. And uh, da, 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 I, I liked it. I thought I thought that was cool that I was that close to getting fucking turned inside out. But uh, yeah, that that would have turned you inside out. That would have oh, turned yeah. that would have turned you all kinds of ways. <laughs> I'm surprised I didn't catch the rest of that burst or whatever. Was, yeah. These guys were hey, you almost really working on grazing fire. But, yeah, you didn't you didn't even you didn't even feel the slight impact the. No, man, I didn't even know. Then yeah. maybe if I'd been sitting still and calm or something and it happened, I would have. But if we were doing the the hit and run stuff, you know, come up, he sees me, I'm down, fire a couple of rounds, run a few right. feet. Hit the yeah. And uh, I don't know when I took the round. I guess it had to have been on the way down <laughs> because yeah. otherwise it would have hit me in the back or, or something. But no, it was, a, it was a weird thing, man. It was my first little brush with uh, taking a gunshot wound. <laughs> I thought it was freaking great. It was like something I had up over the uh, the other guys. But yeah, you know, having this conversation now, you realize what a stupid fucking thing that is to. Bat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was it uh was it somebody else that brought to your attention how much you have changed, or did you just notice? Um, well, I've changed a lot in in a different different ways over the last few years, but uh, my. Uh, my significant other Emily, she uh, she notices the changes and, and updates me on them. Uh, well, actually, I mean, I mean, originally, like when you got when you got out of basic, you go you go overseas, you spend thirteen months in Afghanistan, you come home. Is it like mom or dad or who is it that says something to you, or does everybody just kind of keep quiet? most people kind of keep quiet my uh, my dad though he noticed i guess probably my first year in um and I, I joined in 97 so i was in for four years before anything happened and uh he noticed that my sleep was was bad because I'd, I'd crash out on the couch and, and stuff like that and he he described it as looking troubled and at the time i didn't have anything to be troubled about but i already had that mindset that if I sleep too hard, somebody's going to fucking get me or whatever. And, uh, I'd wake up, you know, every hour and go patrol the damn perimeter. And I, that was something that followed me for the next 20 years. Um, yeah. and I, I still, I, I sleep through the night sometimes, but not all the nights, but it's, yeah, it's not, not it's rare. It just doesn't keep me anymore. Yeah. It's more of a habit now than anything. I get up and go walk outside and look at stuff and check on the dog and whatnot. But, just last just last night um i was i was half I, you know i was sleepwalking and i i do this sometimes where i sleepwalk and i do something and i got up out of the bed last night and my wife woke me up as i was opening the sliding glass door at our bedroom 
She's like, what are you doing? And I was like, I don't know. There was something outside. <laughs> yeah, you know, like I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there's something outside. It's it's weird. I never saw combat, so it's it's strange to me the things that were done to my mind. Like it it really it really is like what kind of advanced capability do they have to do these things to a person's mind, right? Because I'm not even I'm not even on edge anymore. I'm I'm laid back as you get anymore. Like my life is good. I'm just like, yeah, whatever, man. I'm loving life. Like, let's go. But I will still every every once in a while I'll have a dream and my wife will ask me the next day, like, what was that? You were she she told me the other day, she's like, You were punching the dog. And I'm like and I'm like, did he did he run away? And she goes, No, he just laid there. I was like, Well, I must have not been punching him very hard. But at the same time, I, I have pit bulls, so that's like uh, they don't <laughs> they like it. Yeah, they're like, Oh, look, affection, you know. But yeah. but at the same time, it's like, Why did I roll over in my sleep and start punching my fucking dog? Like, <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. So it, it makes me wonder, like what was done to my brain you know in the amount of time that I was in the military what did they do to me to to create scenarios like that because these things things like that didn't happen prior to me going to the military no yeah um, I mean. so it's like what what was that you know and I've been out I, I've been out now since 2003 so you're talking 18 years never saw combat but i still wonder like is this something they put in me is this something they like brainwash me to think or how to feel or how to react to something like what am i dealing with you know emotionally and mentally that that maybe i haven't completely come to fruition in Baby, I'm going to have to get the bag out of the car. Oh, you can get the rest of what's in there. Sorry. You you can get what the rest of what's in there, but I do have a full bag in the car. Okay. As soon as I'm done here, I'll get it. Okay. I'm sorry. Sorry. The dogs want food. <laughs> the dogs want food, and the food container is in the office. So. <laughs> yeah, that, I think it comes down to mental conditioning on that. Yeah. Go ahead, dude. It's all right. The Marines aren't, aren't so shy about it. Like they, uh, they started from the moment you uh, you hit San Diego or Paris Island, I guess. If you go go east, for me it was San Diego. But uh, you know they they start beating shit in your head, and it it almost mirrors the the cognitive behavior therapy stuff, except for it's a lot more intense. And they, you know, you know how it is to to go through the training. It's just there nonstop, nonstop. And ours is 13 weeks, so it's it's just constant fucking everything's left over right. And you know, you start walking with your left foot, you walk 40 inches from people and shit. It just some of it doesn't go away. I used to lose my fucking mind if somebody I was walking with would point at something because to me that meant we were gonna take sniper fire. And and I mean like in a suburban neighborhood in Texas, I, I would think that you're gonna draw sniper fire on me knowing full fucking well that that's possible, but extremely unlikely. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and we can laugh about it because I mean, after, after it's all said and done, it's kind of absurd, but it's not funny. It, it's not yeah. funny. What is done to a person? No, it's not. funny. Uh, I've, I've learned to laugh at absurdity. But, yeah, yeah. Well, I just you said uh, in the Marines it was thirteen weeks, and it, in the Army, um, being infantry, I was I was I was eleven Bravo, so it was um, infantry, and it was sixteen weeks, right? So it was nine weeks basic, and then um, seven weeks of AIT, but it was all connected, and you got a weekend off in between. Um, yeah, and, Ten days before infantry school. Yeah. And and it's you just spend that that time just absorbing all this information, right? 
and and it's really it's really affecting the way that you treat people it's affecting the way that you interact with life it's affecting the way that you interact with people and they don't there's no there's there's no class in which they put you through to put you back in civilian life which is a, a really difficult thing to deal with and you were saying it, it took you a few years to find psilocybin and um, its positive effects on you. How how long are we talking? Like three, five years? How how long was that? Uh, well, I got out a couple of days after uh, Christmas of 2006, and it was 2017 before I really Jeez. found psilocybin. Like, yeah, no. But you were you were really struggling for a long time. A year before that, I had actually gone ahead and uh, tried to 22 out. You know, I took some stuff that I knew would do me in and then uh, huh. changed my mind at the last minute. I mean, it was Christmas Eve one night, man. And I don't want to trigger anybody, but trigger warning. You know, I, I took, uh, I don't I don't handle opiates well. So I took most of a bottle of some methadone I got for the purpose of, of ending my shit. And uh, I knew that I would be too bad off to to turn back but uh i wasn't man uh, it was it was a frozen ass texas night and i kind of found me a little spot to go die in and shallow grave in the frost and uh i changed my mind man and i i put a loaded pistol down my throat to drag the pills up and uh and i did and I, and I fucking lived so christmas day i decided you know when i woke up i was it's been hours and hours and uh the girl I'm with now, my fiance, she was there. She brought me Christmas dinner and, and stuff. And uh, she was like, holy shit, you know, but uh, so was I. And I was like, you know what, man, fuck it. I, I had so many bad like holidays and bad days in general, but I decided that day that it would be my first good Christmas instead of like my last bad one. And, uh, and you know, holidays like that don't mean as much to me now as, as they once did, but yeah, you know, until tonight, I forget about the suicide attempt and stuff. Uh, yeah. It it never really like comes up or anything. But uh, right. thinking about it, you know that that was a that was a rough damn night. I mean, that was really the the pinnacle of I've got to do something to change. And it, that night, it wasn't about changing; it was just about stopping it. And uh, the next day, I, I started trying to work on a way to to fix it. So I really buckled down and started trying to research things and do things and uh, find a way to find a way out of that hole, you know, and get out of the dark. And along the way, I, I tried to bring people with me. And, and that was rough when I was doing like the peer counseling stuff, because I would have to relive my own shit every time I dealt with somebody else's, but uh, helping them out of it kind of reinforce the steps I needed to take. And uh, that was only so effective, but it, it did really get me back on track. It wasn't until my dad died a few years later, no, I guess a year and a half later, that it really it fucking crushed me again. And uh, I was back on substances and, and stuff, trying to kill the pain and shit. But uh, I knew a lot more about how to deal with things. That's why I finally went to go see a shrink and, he started me on the, uh, the micro dose journey. And of course I didn't take his advice at first. I went and sought out ways to do it on my own. I didn't want to go through like a medical center or anything like that. Um, how but, dare, uh, how dare a doctor tell you to take LSD? <laughs> I thought it was a third. I mean, it wasn't a one-time thing. Either, this was a, th is this a setup? You fucking asshole. <laughs> like I know how, I know how military mind works. <laughs> it, it was, it was the most absurd shit I'd ever heard in my life. Like, um, I believed that it, it would probably work, but I, I didn't understand how it could or anything, yeah. but I kind of laughed it off as, as bullshit or whatever. Um, like something I wasn't going to do. And I'd, I'd go see him once a month and every month he'd be like, all right, man, I'm going to keep giving you the pills, antidepressants and any, uh, anxiety stuff, but yeah. you're going to keep coming back and getting the pills. And, you're never going to be cured. You're, you're going to be like this for fucking. You're never, time. you're never going to not need this. Yeah. Unless. Like, yeah. Unless. Exactly. Uh, exactly. And how, how many, 
how many years was that after uh, your service? Uh, shit, probably nine. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So you 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 basically you were being tortured night and day for nine years. Oh yeah, yeah. It, and I, I and and you you met a wonderful woman that you finally made your fiance, but still isn't your wife. Which you and I got to talk about that because she should be your wife at this point after all that <laughs> shit, all yeah. the shit you put her through. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Well, it took her a while to say yes. It's a very Johnny Cash story. I, oh yeah, I, I did the old marry me June thing for fucking years, and oh, you lot. chase her around like a man in black. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, one day she finally said yes, man. Uh, She's like, "Yes, quit asking me now. Can we stay engaged until you leave me alone?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're, uh, we're looking forward to doing like a, a hand fasting pagan kind of thing, and uh, maybe trying to keep the government the fuck out of it. <laughs> but, oh. Cool. That's awesome. I'm, I'm happy for you. Yeah. I'm Thanks. Happy for you. Yeah, that's awesome. But so you're so you're so nine years you went through this, and before you discovered psilocybin, and a doctor he so he had been riding your ass. Had been how how long had he had he been telling you about the treatment? Uh, he told me every month for for about six months or so. Um, and it was, it was after probably the fifth or sixth time, uh, I got a hold of some mushrooms and it had been, you know, 20 years since I'd had any, I'd only done them one time before. And, uh, so that's when, uh, I gave it a little shot and yeah, shit, it, it worked. Somebody actually gave me a, a couple of tabs of LSD too. And I, I took them in little small increments, uh, and it, but shit worked doing it that way instead of trying to party with it or whatever. Uh, take a little bit, and you know, the night and day difference is, is a great analogy because I kind of was able to just reconnect, man. And uh, years of suffering and years of bullshit before that just kind of melted away. Now it took, it didn't take really, uh, it worked, it helped a lot. But then I, I stopped doing it and uh, some other stuff happened and, you know, there were some triggered moments and <clears throat> went through some more shit. And uh, eventually I came back around to uh, to dealing with it, with the psilocybin and uh, man, my whole life is better. Like, I'm happy every day. I don't worry about the little kid. I don't worry about the past shit. It, it's a crazy, crazy feeling to to talk about like all my traumas and stuff with you and it almost feels so, like you know, it almost feels like another person another lifetime ago it, it does man it, it's like it splits you and just <sighs> kind of it's kind of like if you forked your your pathway from when you were young and nothing had happened to you and then you have this alternate fucking life where everything went wrong and then over here on the other branch everything's going right and right. uh yeah. Even you know something doesn't go right, you know, like the car breaks down or whatever, it's it's still better. You know, it's, right. it's something you can deal with without getting shitty drunk and punching holes and stuff and <laughs> calling people names and, and shit. Yeah. Yeah. So So when you're um okay, so since since the point where you did begin to believe in the process of psilocybin, it is not only changed your life in the in the metaphysical sense and 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 moved you into a different mentality and psychology but it's also changed your life in the way that you deal with others and so talk a little bit about like we got about 15 minutes before we hit an hour so talk a little bit about what it is that you're doing with psilocybin and how you're, how you're experimenting with it and, and how you're trying to help others with it, because that's, that's really cool too. Yeah. Um, so just on the home front, um, she and I'll take, uh, take a little tea and, uh, a low dose of, of potent stuff. And, uh, 
we'll hang out together. We noticed the first time we were up, you know, for hours and I was like, holy shit, man, look, we've been doing this all night and we haven't hurt each other's feelings yet. And, <laughs> and, and we haven't, I would say that, that just doing that between the two of us has made our relationship just cemented in, in this bond that you, you can't break. I don't, I don't want to hang around with people or anything. Like I find I'm, uh, I find that whenever I do psilocybin, I'm more sensitive. Do you find that to be the case? Yeah. Yeah. I definitely have. I've become a more tolerant and caring person that now the, the fights that, that I want to pick are the ones that make people's life better. I see somebody suffer at something. I'm like, Hey man, look, don't, don't, don't worry about this stuff. And, I run around telling everybody about the benefits of mushrooms and everybody thinks I'm black and stuff. But yeah, I find myself like not only defending the, like it where there's a guy that gets picked on and uh, in the past, I, I like to beat up bullies and shit because then I got to be a bully, but guilt free. And uh, <laughs> now guilt free I find bullying. This, that's the way of the future. <laughs> yeah, man, it's hunting predators. And uh, so you can justify those behaviors by, kicking the shit out of somebody that needs it or whatever. But that's why I joined the Marines. But now it's much different. Now I'm like, hey, man, look, that guy, he knows all of his flaws. And fucking getting in his face and pointing them out to him isn't going to help him at all. You know? Why don't you fucking spend a little time and, and work with him and, and try to try to understand what he's going through? Because you may call this guy a name – and he'll go home and fucking kill himself because it was just that one last thing that he needed to push into the ledge or whatever. So I find myself really sensitive to to people's actions against others and for others. Um, you know, like I've even dialed it back, like social media and stuff. I'm, I'm almost non-existent on it because I, I don't care for the negativity. So I've got a, got a Reddit account and I follow positive stuff and like uh, – I won't turn my head from somebody that's in need or anything, but all of the mean shit, I just kind of stay away from, you know, I, I don't have anything to prove anymore with, with violence or any of that stuff. Or nobody needs to know how tough I am or whatever, but uh, I go for the simpler, like more friendly approach to, to things. Yeah. I, I grow stuff now. If I find like my little herb garden outside flowers and shit and, uh, I, I noticed my dad when he hit his forties, he started growing a garden and uh, I do that too, man. I find that nurturing something like a plant or my dog, uh, or even my family, God forbid you nurture the people around you, but um, that's really been a bigger deal to me. And it was something in the past that never occurred to me to do. My uh, dog is my family. <laughs> man, I've got a big hundred pound fat lump of dog laying next to me right now yeah I, I got a i got a hundred pound pit bull that i have to keep out of this room or he we would never <laughs> have a conversation because as soon as i opened my mouth he would be all over me yeah mine, mine's pretty much like that he's, he's an old dog though he's 20 pounds overweight well he's only two years old so if, oh, yeah. if, if i let him in this room like you'd be like are you listening to me i'd be like uh <laughs> yeah. I used to rescue kids, man. They're great dogs. They have so much personality and, and feeling. Uh, first pit bull I ever got, somebody had shot, and I knew what to do about gunshot wounds. So I, yeah. I got the bullet out of her, sewed her up, and gave her pain pills and stuff until we were we were friends. And my first thought when I saw her was, I, I need to shoot this fucking animal because she looked like a beast. But I saw that somebody already had. I was like, holy shit, man. I felt bad about it. Shooting so, this animal is not going to help the situation. <laughs> no, no, it was only every shot. And it didn't work, so maybe I'll be friends with her. <laughs> uh, after that, she was the first of several pit bulls after that. Uh, this guy's not a pit. He's a either cattle or cur, or black mouth cur mixed with something. But black mouth I'm curs third. are great dogs, though. They're yeah, great dogs. This I'll, guy's I'll, when, when we get off the – when we stop recording, I'll – I'll call mine in here and let him come say hi because he, he would love nothing more, but I'm not going to do it while I'm still on the podcast. But <laughs> so I, I was, I was recording out of my truck for, for a long time and he was involved in every podcast, but he got to the point where I, <laughs> when, when I came home and I started recording local, um, uh, 
I, I just couldn't deal with him because he would in the truck he would stop and he would lay in in the in the seat next to me and he'd be cool while I was talking but at the house he never stops he's all jump 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 <laughs> jump and there's no getting him to stop so I just I have to close my door and be like okay you're gonna have to be out there I gotta be in here because I gotta take care of this because um, I'm doing something at the moment but um what was the um what was the most I don't even know the right word. What 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 was it that you first felt change when you when you uh started taking psilocybin? What was the first thing in your mind that clicked and said, "Oh, this is different." Like this is different than every other treatment I've had. This is different than everything I've ever experienced before. This is something I really need to latch on to and be part of. So much of the focus of my podcast is to point out abuses of power and how bad things have gotten and the direction in which we're heading as a society. And it can be a real black pill. I've partnered up with Richard Grove to offer my listeners an opportunity to sign up to his autonomy course. Uh, the autonomy course is designed for people looking for solutions, people that want to shape their own future, people that are not willing to be at the behest of large corporations or the United States government or the banking system. The autonomy course is designed for those of you who wish to have complete control of the reins of your life, who are looking to be successful, that to thrive and not just survive, to provide for your family by utilizing your existing skills and learning how to market and sell those skills in order to be your own boss or learn new skills in order to leverage that into a new career opportunity. So if there's a job out there you've been trying to get or you've been wishing you could get, but you just don't have the skills for it, the autonomy course is the place for you to start to learn how to land that position to learn how to market yourself better to gain confidence and to be surrounded by a community of like-minded people that will encourage you and help you along the way so use my affiliate links and go check out the autonomy course it could be right for you well they have a there's a term called ego death and it, it a lot of times is what causes those challenging or bad trips for people it's what forces you to take a look at what an asshole you are uh, and and then kill it and uh yeah. the first now, part of the thing may hold, let me i'm going to interrupt you just for a second when you when you talk about ego death when you're talking about these bad trips is this kind of like um i don't know you ever read carl young is this is this kind of like what carl young meant by the shadow yeah yeah uh, very much man like you you meet yourself on a uneven ground and and you don't have the advantage and uh it, it's fucking rough man depending on uh depending on who you are inside but fortunately i'd already spent years trying to fight those demons back and stuff so uh, so for me is part of the is part of psilocybin being beneficial is is part of that having faced the darkest parts of yourself already and and you need that light like extended on yourself through the substance like how does that work uh kind of like that man was like emily and me we, we tripped together and uh like like i said the first time we were just like you know holy shit a, a light bulb went off and uh we were being nice to each other and having fun and uh, like kids you know and uh that's that's where it went for me. That was my first my first positive change was to really care about somebody else and look at what a dick I'd been about things and, and even about bad stuff that had happened between us. And like, you know what? We're we're here right now and, and none of that shit matters apparently because we're having a good time. So look just let everything go. Just and we did. We we let all of so the stuff in the past. Is happen. is it is it religious? And, uh, and it can feel that okay. way 
yeah, you, you could you could equate it to religion or, or spiritualism or something. Um, it's definitely an awakening. I, something inside you wakes up, like like the old you, and you're like, "Hey, fuck, man!" Like kind of waking up from a bad dream or something. Like, what, what the what's been going on in my life? It's some bullshit. This is not the way I would have done things. But uh, it. I don't know. Some people talk to God. Some people meet aliens. Some people meet other gods that nobody's ever heard of. Uh, for me, it was it was different. But, but huh? I, I think. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, uh, Emily's with me. She was saying she she talked to a star. Um, Sky. <laughs> yeah, she, she fixated on a, on a star and, and had an understanding with with that. Um, it's crazy when you go out in the, to like nature all with on the stuff. We'll go for walks and you can you can feel the trees talk to you and the breeze and, and stuff. And yeah. Uh, obviously they're not speaking words, but this, there's, the, there's, a, a com- there's communication. Uh, yeah. There's, there's a- and that's that's something I've always been like really intrigued with was I'm very much which is part of the reason I moved out to the middle of nowhere. I'm very intrigued with nature and the communication between man and nature right yeah. and i'm just wondering is when when you start going through this this thing that you you go through is it like a form of repentance and and you're really like repenting and coming to terms with the evils that you're capable of and understanding what it is that you were involved in or, or is there something else there that maybe I'm missing? You, you could equate it to a repentance, but I wouldn't compare it to the type like uh, that, that you would see it like a Christian church where it's cheerful and, and all this shit. Like for us, it, it was a really positive thing. So it definitely was a, a reckoning of sorts and a repentance, but without any negative emotion to it. It was just a very positive, like rebirth almost. Um, just, it's like the, uh, the inner youth coming back out. And, uh, you know, I feel 20 again, but without all the burdens and stuff I had when I was 20. You look 20. Thanks, man. Um, I tried to act 20. You're a good looking guy. Yeah. <laughs> I quit drinking. I would shed all this and I'd look as good as you do. <laughs> <laughs> Drinking and smoking like kicks my ass. Um, yeah, I quit smoking a, a few months ago. Um, oh, did I'm you? Still in, yeah, I'm still in vibe a little, little bud here and there, but mostly it was CBD until they recently canceled that. But uh, I've got a full bar. My parents were alcoholics, and I've got a really impressive bar, like sitting right across from us. Uh, yeah, I, I take a, a drink once a month or something now, maybe, and. Yeah. Most of that's just to kind of give the bar some exercise. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I haven't had a scotch in about a month. It's about that oh, time. Yeah. <laughs> I've got, I've got decanters with absinthe and fucking red eye. Um, yeah, nice. Hey, what, I mean, what's better than a, than a nice scotch and a cigar and sit out on the porch and just relax, right? Yeah, very, very little is is better than that, unless you're in good company too, and. If you've got the right person with you, it, it trumps all of it. But, uh, yeah. but you know, a, a good fucking dog can do can do the same thing. But uh, yeah, man, it, I'm not a, I'm not anti alcohol or anything. I just quit using it to to destroy my liver. <laughs> like <laughs> I still like it, but I don't feel the need to like go get shitty drunk because I, I wasn't a drinker. I was a, a binge drinker. I, yeah. If I started drinking, I wanted to drink to get drunk. And uh, I eventually grew out of that. And, you know, like psilocybin, I don't know, they, they use it to treat addiction and stuff like that. And I can see how, because I, like I use these little nicotine pouches I'm addicted to, but <coughs> got, off, got off cigarettes after forever. And uh, I, I just started smoking to get off snuff. <laughs> so now I use like, cut out the middle man and just go straight to the nicotine but uh right yeah you know, like drugs alcohol and stuff like that I don't even don't even think about it you know it's just a thing of the past i have to remember that i've got a bar <laughs> well tell us <laughs> it's tell mostly us, uh tell us a little bit about what you're creating the um the uh 
substances that you're working with and you're creating at this moment? Because I know you're doing a little bit as far as creating... Um, you're making some substances that are, uh, I guess, would be micro dosing in a way but but you're doing it a different way so i kind of wanted to hear about that because i'm not real familiar with what it is that you're doing um well basically you uh, you can you can cultivate these things um from from the source and uh you don't really doctor them up in any kind of way you just sort of right nurture them into existence and then you can you can dry them out, crush them up, and meter out uh, like small amounts, microdose amounts, and put them in some capsules. And uh, those have proven to to be really beneficial to people. Um, also, some stuff called blue honey. It, yeah. It's basically. I remember yeah. making that in high school. Yeah, yeah. But it uh, wasn't for microdosing; it was just for fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it works just the same. Um, also tea you can uh you can make chocolate uh i haven't tried that yet that's next on the list but i see i see it for sale commercially and stuff but i try to avoid commercial consumption of, of stuff like that because yeah. it, it's either going to be a problem or it's going to be a bad fucking problem yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh but my way man everything's just just all natural you know? i don't do anything to to make it better or worse or anything. I just kind of experiment around with different strains of things. And, uh, are you working, are you working specifically with vets on, on this situation or are you just working with whoever people, man? Cause, uh, one of the things I've learned is that you don't have to be a veteran to have post stress and you don't have to have post stress to really need some help. You know, the, everybody's capable of feeling the same pain and, and a veteran's post stress is exactly the same physiologically as someone who's been in a bad car wreck or something and, and never had any service. So we all experience pain the same way and we can all beat pain in the same way. Yeah. And people just don't know about it because it's been vilified and demonized by churches and governments and big pharma and now big pharma's, studying the shit out of it trying to figure out a way to make a buck on it but uh it's one of those things they'll never really be able to do because you can you can duplicate one of these things from a single spore if you've got a little knowledge then uh you don't even have to i mean if you've got nine <laughs> acres somewhere on your nine acres is growing a damn psilocybe cubensis whether you want it to or not oh uh, there's all kinds of mushrooms growing out of here i just don't know what the hell they are that's the thing man like uh, i'm not really a great forager but i got the field guides and stuff today i found some uh, stuff they call hen of the woods but i'm not ballsy enough to go try to eat it just yet i, I want to consult <laughs> the guide and the gurus and all that stuff but it's supposed to taste just like fried chicken like you, you cut it up fry it up and it's supposed to be like chicken strips or something but uh i'm content just to let it live where it is because my mycelium has got a, its own intelligence and its own immunity and uh it, it's a living organism you know it's a i try to I try to work with it instead of just destroying it out of fucking out of hand. Yeah. I mean, out of carelessness. I, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, it's, it's not the only kind of mushroom that's got great benefits for people. There's lion's mane does all kind of great stuff for your brain, uh, re repairs neurological damage and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. helps people with Parkinson's and there's, uh, there's mushrooms for, uh, high blood pressure i got a uh, my my dumb ass got penis envy and lion's mane confused the other day so <laughs> well it's hard to do if you see them side by side because i'm sure it would be it was just the uh it was just a picture of lion's mane and i was like oh yeah that shit's like that shit's supposed to be pretty good and my wife's like this isn't psilocybin i'm like yeah oh, yeah it is and then, <laughs> and then she's talking to my buddy that i told you about earlier and he was like, no, no, it's not. And I'm like, yeah, that penis envy. And she was like, no, this is lion's mane. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm a fucking <laughs> retard. It, it takes a little while, man. There, there are thousands and thousands of mushrooms just locally. And, uh, there's a 
block of mycelium two miles wide growing in fucking Wyoming somewhere underground. And uh, <laughs> somebody somebody actually injected lion's mane into a, a, an oil spill one time, and it became its own little ecosystem. And uh, Oh, wow. Birds started living on it. Plant life grew. And uh, when it was all said and done, you could actually eat the damn lion's mane because it had broken down the petroleum and not that I would do it, but the shit became edible and, you know, would give you nutrients instead of, Oh shit. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, It's so much crazy shit that it does. You can have a mycelial network underground and one tree can drop a little seed becomes a sapling and they can use the mycelium network as a conduit to communicate with each other. Like a fucking ethernet network. It's crazy as shit. That's wild. Yeah, that it's a really big universe. It's untapped that uh, very few people study in depth. I, I wish that I was like a scholarly mycologist, but uh, I'm working on it slowly. And I'd say I'm more of a hobbyist, but <laughs> I've cool. learned a lot, though. And I mean, there's you go from the phase where you don't know which ones in the cow shit are the right ones and which ones will kill you. Yeah. To uh, Hey, this one lowers your blood pressure. This one makes you bigger. This one makes you smaller. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild, man. Yeah. All yeah. right. Well, look, let's stop the recording here and uh, tell anybody like anything you need to tell them where they can find you. Like if you're writing somewhere, anything like that, because I think the information and the things we're talking about, there are people that are going to get like benefits out of it. Uh, well, I guess the the number one place to find me, you could uh, could get on Reddit and look at u slash wit with w i t w i t h. Um, I certainly won't engage in any commerce or anything, but I'm happy to answer any questions about anything related. Um, says there's and that that's where I draw the line at. No sales no no any of that kind of shit uh, i won't point you to a guy that, that sells drugs over behind the stuff <laughs> but if you want to know about the benefits and and how all that stuff works i'll happily go on about that shit for days or, or direct you to, to different resources and stuff right well i i'm plan i i hope we do this again i think that this as a beginning episode and kind of getting to know each other a little bit better um, is is a good starting point. And maybe we can dig a little deeper into things as subjects pop into mind and uh, discuss those offline and then maybe make, it ep- make episodes out of them. Uh, yeah. Because be these subjects are very interesting to a lot of people and they're very useful and helpful to a lot of people so man it can not only save save lives uh, by preventing you know self-termination and stuff it can really just change your life it'll save the quality of your life um, make make everything better even even end of life quality uh, right the swedes and, and even in america now they've been experimenting with uh you know, facing death from terminal illness and, and it can really ease the passage and uh, in a positive way. And, uh, if I, I can remember, help, uh, anybody. I remember hearing that, um, Huxley, I think it was Aldous Huxley yeah. insisted that they give him psilocybin mushrooms while he was on his deathbed because it was going to make it easier for him to pass to the afterlife. He was right too. Hunter S. Thompson went out on LSD, and yeah. it it makes a big difference. Uh, and I can tell you just from having, uh, I don't know, like the general paranoia you start to get when you get to our age. Like it's, we're gonna have a fucking heart attack from smoking too many cigarettes today. <laughs> you start worrying about shit that you didn't used to worry about because right. You know, like, start but facing body, your morality. Yeah. yeah, like, yeah. Oh. I'm going to die one of these days. Like it's just, it's inevitable. Like it's coming. It's right there. Yeah. I can see it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a lot closer these days than it was. I mean, and it's always potentially right around the corner, man. You never really know, it, but sometimes it kind of creeps in your mind and won't fucking won't let go of that thought that it's right outside the door. And yeah. uh, psilocybin just tells it to fuck off. You know, maybe it is right around the corner, but 
fucking there's something else you know no reason to be thinking about it because there ain't nothing you can do about it no man and it's not necessarily the fucking worst thing or the end thing or whatever it's weird the the reaction that it gives to you but it it can turn i think almost anything that's shitty into a a positive thing and not artificially it just changes your understanding of it right yeah really helps you to deal with things so and and that's way better i think than taking fucking Xanax till you can't remember your name. And like when you run out of Xanax, you still fucking feel like shit. And uh, then you got to go to the doctor and still feel like shit after that. Yeah. I go to the doctor and ask the doctor, what the fuck's my name? Yeah. <laughs> my name is supposed to have like how, how much face. money did I try to steal from people that trusted me? Like exactly what happened? Yeah. Uh, can you give me some more of those pills? Maybe me a piece of shit. Yeah, exactly. Maybe feel better, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Fuck that, man. Like, you can walk out in your yard and put a stop to that shit. Have a good time doing it. And uh, for the people worried about being inebriated and stuff, when you microdose, you don't even feel the effect of, of a high or anything. You just feel fucking better. Like, right. Um, so, like, I know a lot of like hardline people don't want to take drugs or whatever, but mushrooms aren't drugs, man. And they uh, they pop out of the ground on their own and they do what they do. But uh, you know, some of them you can eat. By the way, you can eat any mushroom you want. Some of them you only eat once. <laughs> like, all mushrooms are aptly named. Lion's mane looks like lion's mane. Penis envy, guess what? But, uh, you know, you're going to have shit called, like, destroying angel and fucking mushroom of motherfucking murder death. And, like, the ones that you're not supposed to eat have names that tell you you're not supposed to yeah. eat. Yeah, stay away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah so, but um anyway man good talk um i'm available whenever so oh it's great dude and we'll definitely do it again i'm gonna uh, plug one more time your reddit and then i'm gonna stop the recording right on, uh that's that's you slash wit with w-i-t w-i-t-h on uh cool. on reddit cool 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 i'm gonna stop the recording right now Choose well, it's a game that was made for you to lose. It doesn't really matter how many times, it's the same old worn out story, same old lines. There are one dirty fingers in hypocrisy, bragging on their feet of mediocrity again. Never really making any kind of change. Don't feed them cause we don't even need them I never celebrate the tyrants out of taking our freedoms Yeah, I said fuck them Don't feed them cause we don't even need them I never celebrate the tyrants out of taking our freedoms What's it gonna take for you to see That we're living in a wrecked democracy Don't feed them cause we don't even need them I never celebrate the towns out of taking our feet